called Discipline and Punish, and it has a lot to do has a lot to do with inmates. And Discipline and Punish talks about that the thinking behind the prison system in the United States is to punish. It is not to rehabilitate. So the thinking behind it, that those who have been convicted and who are either in jail or in prison, that the reason why services are provided to them is that they're not supposed to be getting services. They're supposed to be being punished. And that's the whole concept. I'm not saying I agree or disagree, but that thinking and true rehabilitation is actually supposed to start until they finish their time of punishment. Right? So that brings a really interesting question about the word inmate. And if people are inmates, are, are you no longer citizens? Are you, um, are you still considered human? Um, is there anything about the word inmate and, and how that applies to Peter Summit that you might like to talk to uh, about, Mr. Reed? Sure, do you mind if I uh, just introduce myself? <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Louis L. Reed. Uh, I am the national organizer for Cut 50. Cut 50 is a bipartisan organization uh, co founded by CNN political commentator and uh, just all around person extraordinaire, Van Jones. I'm here to talk to you about a few things today. First and foremost, uh, I talked to the good doctor this morning, and uh, I want to talk to you about something that is extrapolated from the book of Mark, chapter 5. Anybody <coughs> familiar with your Bibles? Amen. Amen. Yeah. In the book of Mark, chapter 5, uh, there was a woman who had an issue. Come on. Yes. Come on. Come on. She had an issue of blood. In all of her life, not all of her life, but of a good portion of her life, uh, I suspect, for approximately 18 years, she was defined by this particular issue. She was de defined by this issue of blood. And wherever she went, if you understand a little bit about uh, Jewish uh, history, she had to holler, unclean, mm. unclean, unclean, to announce to the people who would be approaching her that she was, in fact, unclean. And while we do not know this woman's name, one thing that we can identify with is her issue. Interestingly enough, good doctor, oftentimes when people who are incarcerated, when they are titled inmates, and they are called prisoners, and they are called ex-cons and the likes thereof, essentially what we are doing is reducing them down to their issue. We're reducing them down to their issue. And I, I, I wonder if I'm the only person in the room that has, that has ever made a mistake. Am I in the majority of a minority in saying that I'm the only person in the room that has ever made a mistake? And I wonder what my life would be like if it was defined by the one singular mistake that I have made. Issues. <laughs> Issues. I'm not going to preach this morning. I got to preach tomorrow. But, 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 but I just wanted to leave you with that. Reason being is because anytime we hear the word enemy, anytime we hear the word prisoner, anytime we hear the word ex-con, anytime we hear the word uh, 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 felon and, and, and the degree thereof, what we are doing is essentially we are relegating people down to their singular issues. Why is this so important to me? I'm glad that you asked. I served nearly 14 years in federal prison. Served nearly 14 years in federal prison. 13959014. That is my federal registration number. You notice that I didn't say federal inmate number. I didn't say federal prison number. That is my federal registration number. Because even when I was in prison, I was still a person. Yes. Even when I was in prison, I was still a father. Even when I was in prison, I was still somebody's son. Even when I was in prison, I was still somebody's brother. I was still somebody's neighbor. I was still someone that someone on the outside cared about, although I was on the inside. So I just wanted to push back on the notion because I, uh, uh, oftentimes we, we can be ignorant, and I'm not necessarily saying ignorant in, in to the degree that we're stupid, but I'm talking about we can ignore. We can ignore how we interact with people. As a licensed clinician, oh, I didn't tell you that. As a licensed clinician, uh, uh, I would never define one of my patients as a crack addict. My goodness, my goodness, that's right. My 
I would never, I would never define one of my my, my, my my patients as a junkie. Yeah. So why is it that when 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 it comes to the to the prisoner population of people who are incarcerated, why is it that most of which look like you, most of which are your sons, or are, are your daughters, are your cousins, are your aunties in them, most of which who happen to be black, brown, and poor, white? Why is it that we perpetuate the same language that the that the system wants to relegate them by? So I didn't come here to talk to you about that, but I just wanted to add that as, as just a, a slight appetizer of this sort uh, uh, to my main discourse. You ready to talk this morning? Yeah. We got some people that's fired up and ready to talk yeah. this morning. I, I can't, by a round of applause. How many people are fired up and ready to talk this morning? Thank you, thank you. First and foremost, you know, second of all, I just want to thank uh, the organizers. I want to thank uh, Tosca. She's been doing this uh, for approximately, I, I, I've been involved in it uh, for the past uh, two to three years or so, and everyone else, who is actually in the room today? It sounds like you guys have been learning something that is, you know, just absolutely phenomenal. So you should give yourselves a round of applause just for being present, for being in the room, for being attentive. Uh, on behalf of Van Jones and the entire Cut Fifty team, I know that there is, a, uh, I know that there's a PSA that we're going to be showing later on. Uh, unfortunately, Van was not able to be here today. We were actually in Louisville uh, all week long, uh, in, involved in a Kentucky fellowship with some young men who uh, the system would say would be uh, uh, at, at risk. Uh, we just say that they have an uh, opportunity deficiency. Uh, so we were actually in, in Kentucky uh, all week and Van had to get back to do some, some things related to CNN. But he sends his love, he sends his thoughts, he sends his shout outs, and he sent, sent me. So if, if, if Van sent me, then I, I would guess that you guys are in good hands. But I want to talk to you today about the fierce urgency of now. The fierce urgency of now. The fierce urgency of now. In 1963, there was a guy that you very well may have heard about. He's not, not very famous, but um, he was a small uh, Baptist preacher. And he went by the name, I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. You may have heard of him, you may not have heard of him. I, I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. Have you ever heard of this guy? Not Martin Luther King Sr.? No, 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 it was Jr. It was, it was Jr., yeah. He, he, this, this guy, he, he, had a, he had a very small, uh, he played a very small role in, in, in something that was called the Civil Rights Movement. And he stood in the shadow of the 16th president on the march in Washington. And he talked about the fierce urgency of now. He also sat in a Birmingham jail and he wrote what I can personally consider as the, uh, uh, as the, the, as the epistle of the 20th century in a letter called the Birmingham, uh, from the Birmingham jail. And within that letter, one of the things that he talked about, he said that oftentimes when we hear from white moderates for us to wait, in effect it means do nothing at all. And he talked about, within that framework, he was saying that, that, that America was, had to be prepared for not a moment, but a movement. <laughs> See, I, I, I can say this as black folks, we are too caught up in moments and not necessarily postured for movements. We're too caught up in moments, we're too caught up in trends, we're too caught up in news cycles, we're too caught up in sound bites to actually digest the full scope of what we actually need to take in. The difference between a moment and a movement. So when he was on this, 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 when he was standing in the shadow of Abraham Lincoln and he was talking about this, this so-called dream that he had, he was talking about the fierce urgency of now. And he was talking about how America had to wake up from its, its sleep apnea of the sort. And he was talking about how America needed to take notice to its citizens who have been disenfranchised. I'm here today in the 21st century after having served 14 years uh, in federal prison to tell you that there is still a fierce urgency of now. There's a fierce urgency of now as it relates to our criminal justice system. There's a fierce urgency of now as it relates to prison and sentencing reform. There is a fierce urgency of now as it relates to women who are currently in custody, who have their legs shackled to the side of a gurney yes. mm. at the most vulnerable time in their life. Yeah. And they are given birth while in leg restraints. If that doesn't move you, then nothing else will move you. 
If that doesn't, if that doesn't pr provoke a righteous indignation in your spirit, then nothing will. If that, if that doesn't prick your humanity, then, then woe be unto you. There is no way in the United States of America that we should be sending women who are pregnant to, uh, 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 to prison, not, not necessarily for the crimes that they committed, but for them to be punished and have their legs strapped to the side of a gurney and be shackled and given birth while they are in shackles. There's no way in the United States of America that we should sanction that and as taxpaying citizens that we should allow it. There is a fierce, there's a fierce urgency of now. There's a fierce urgency of now because we are allowing people to be released from our federal prison systems without an identification card. Yeah. Yeah. Quick story: When after I after I, uh, when I was released uh, after nearly 14 years in federal prison, I literally had to take my identification card. It said it said Lewis L. Reed and it said a uh, 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 prison number uh, and it had one three nine five nine zero one four and I stuck it at the bottom of my shoe. At the risk of if I would have gotten caught, it would have jeopardized my release. But I wanted something to identify me. Good doctor, I wanted something that, that even, even if it was an, it, a so-called inmate identification card, I wanted something that when I was on the bus and when I went back to society, I could say, hey, at least I have a picture and the federal government said that this is who I am. So I'm hoping that you will accept who I am. But there's a fierce urgency of now because there's no way that we should be allowing people to go back into society without giving them uh, access to basic literacy, without access to effective programming, without access to vocational training. There is a fierce urgency of now. There are approximately 16,000 people in our federal prison system who are currently waitlisted for basic literacy, for basic, for basic GED testing. How are we supposed to give people the tools that they need in order to come out and thrive in society and be change agents and to make meaningful contributions back into our communities if they can't even uh, 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 differentiate, differentiate C spot go versus C spot sit? There's a fierce urgency of now. Most of these people are coming back into your congregations. <laughs> whether you realize it or not. And I'm not talking about your congregations within the four walls of a church. I'm talking about your congregations as it relates to the community that you live in. I, you have a responsibility. If you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, if, oh, oh, what, what I, I hear, I hear the Lord preaching in my head. Do you mind if I just turn on my Sunday morning voice? I hear the Lord preaching in my head. He said that on the day of judgment, you will be evaluated by, by having seen prisoners. Yeah. And you want to say, Lord, when did I see you in prison? He said, whatsoever you did unto the least of men, <laughs> you did also unto me. There is a fierce urgency of now. We have to hold our elected leaders accountable. But before we hold our elected leaders accountable, we have to be responsible. We have to be responsible to the men and women who are returning back into our communities and give them resources. We have to be responsible that if they do write a letter to our congregations, that if we are connected with them, that we respond in kind. We have to be responsible because whatsoever you do unto the least of them, <laughs> you did also unto him. Capital H, I, N. There is a fierce urgency of now. So I want to talk to you about a, a, a particular piece of legislation which is called the First Step Act. The First Step Act. In May of this year, we introduced Cut 50 and other interested organizations, approximately 150 nationwide. We introduced a bill that was sponsored and written by Representative Hakeem Jeffries and also Doug Collins. It was a bipartisan introduced bill that was introduced into the House, U.S. House of Representatives, and passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. One of the few provisions that are included in the bill are access to literacy, our access to basic education. 
it would prohibit the shackling of women who are incarcerated only in and pregnant. Prisons. And only in federal prisons. And only in federal prisons. But the, the story doesn't stop here. Thank you for bringing that up. Because Cut 50 has worked with nine states and we have introduced what we call dignity bills. And they have been passed in nine states that would prohibit the shackling and solitary confinement of women who are pregnant and incarcerated. So while it, it is only relegated, this particular bill is only relegated to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, we are working nationwide to make sure that dignity and decency for women are restored while they are, at, in fact, incarcerated. So back to the above. The First Step Act would call, would call for the prohibition of the shackling of pregnant women and also the solitary confinement under the guise of their so-called safety. It would also reduce the federal prison population by approximately 30,000 over the next 10 years. It would provide escrow accounts for when people are released and that they can have a little bit of change in their pocket. It would also allow for identification cards to be issued prior to these people being released. And on the sentencing side, one of the things that we are calling for is that it would, it would, uh, and I don't want to be too technical with USC codes, but it would uh, bring about uh, uh, equity with the crack and cocaine disparity and allow retroactivity for these people who have who have been disproportionately sentenced and excessively prosecuted simply because of the color of their skin and what street corner they happen to be indicted from. <laughs> that was a palatable way of, of, of saying just because you ain't white, you ain't right. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. I got, I got my amen corner over here. So, so, so I want to challenge your understanding. I want to challenge your understanding, not as preachers, but as ministers, because we are all ministers. Ministers simply mean servants. And if you are to serve your community, if you are to serve Christ, if we are to serve one another, then we cannot forget about those who are disenfranchised. We cannot forget about those who are disproportionately impacted. We can't forget about those who are excessively prosecuted. I live by a simple creed. Those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from resources and power. Let me say that again in the event that you missed it and you want to write it down. Those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from resources and power. So how do we hold our elected officials accountable? Your voices have to be heard. Your voices have to be heard. I talked about the First Step Act. You can go to firststepact.org forward slash action. You can tweet. You can send a letter to your respective elective, elected officials. And or you can make a place a phone call within approximately 30 seconds. We leave you without excuse. We leave you without excuse. All you have to go in and you fill in the populated, uh, populated fields and it will literally send a letter on your behalf. It will literally send out a tweet on your behalf. It will literally, once you press, a, once you press the call now button, your, your, your phone will ring. And if it's the weekend, it'll say, we'll call you back Monday morning, first thing at 9 o'clock to remind you. We leave you without excuse. So in closing, because I know I'm boring you, uh, I just want to tell you this. I want to tell you this. I came all the way from Connecticut. I know that you think that is a whole bunch of white picket fences and manicure lawns in Connecticut, but I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport is the Brooklyn of New York. It's the Chicago of Illinois. It's the Compton of, Los, uh, of California. It's the Memphis of Tennessee. So I haven't seen many manicure lawns where I'm from. I've seen a whole bunch of projects and a whole bunch of people getting shot, but I ain't seen many manicure lawns where I'm from. I came all the way from Bridgeport, Connecticut to tell you that there's a fierce urgency of now. And woe be unto you if you sit in a room full of knowledge, 
full of impartation, full of stimulation, and you take no action. Thank you for your time. Excellent.